Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us in our Western Jamaica Jampro Exporters Forum. My name is Conrad Robinson. I am the manager for the Jampro Western Regional Office, and I will be your moderator for this morning. Our webinar this morning is focusing on Do Business Jamaica Delivering World-Class Export Products, uh, a webinar in which we will be sharing market insights for exporters and buyers. It is really a pleasure having you. But before we begin, there are a few housekeeping matters that I'd like to bring to your attention. So here are the ground rules that will be um, governing our webinar this morning. This event is being recorded. All video and audio have been turned off for participants. If you have questions, please share in the Q&A box below. And if you prefer to verbalize your questions, please use the raise hand icon so that our technical team can enable your microphone. Again, let me encourage you to use the Q&A box for your questions. Uh, we welcome all of you who have joined us so far. And I, I'm going to invite at this time our president, Miss Diane Edwards, who will be given the welcome, the official welcome, and uh, brief remarks. Thank you very much, President, for joining us this morning, and I hand over to you now. Thank you, Conrad. And, and let me just say a warm welcome to everyone who is joining us this morning. I particularly want to recognize the Honorable Aubin Hill, our Minister of Industry, Investment and Commerce, and Jampro and Jampro's minister. Um, I would love to recognize also Senator the Honorable Norman Dunn, Minister of State in the Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce, who I believe will be with us this morning. Dr. Al Powell, Chief Executive Officer of Agro Investment Corporation, who is one of our sister agencies in developing the agribusiness space. Mr. Stephen Dawkins, a great friend of Jampro and chair of the JMEA's Export and Logistics Standing Committee. Mr. Mohan Jagnarine, another old friend of Jampro, executive director of Spur Tree Spices Jamaica Limited. And we have a number of really distinguished panelists this morning, and we're very excited to share this whole podium with you. So I also want to recognize members of my executive team. We have Gabriel Heron, Vice President of Marketing, and Norman Nahr, Vice President of Sales and Promotions, and of course, our host, Conrad Robinson, who is really the initiator of this event. And of course, all our valued guests participating in this forum today. So a warm good morning and welcome to this forum on delivering world-class export products which is something that we know Jamaica can do and that Jamaica aspires to do. So today I'm here to share a bit about Jampro's role and the support that we provide to the trade process through our targeted programs and initiatives. To better understand these programs, I want to highlight a bit of what we do here at Jampro. As Jamaica's premier foreign investment and trade organization, our efforts to encourage export growth are multi-pronged and focus primarily on new market development, market research on the opportunities for Jamaican products, buyer targeting, business matchmaking, and reducing the overall barriers to trade by advocating for policy changes. Export starts with understanding the consumer of your products, and that is critical because we need to know who we're selling to, both in our home market and in our export market. And we need to understand market opportunities. Where are the niches that we can target? We're a small country, we have to go for niche marketing. Planning the route to market is critical and the logistics of getting the product to market are also critical as is finding the right buyer. And Jampro accompanies you every step of the way. To achieve our goals, we work with multiple stakeholders, including local agencies, including Jamaica Customs Agency, Trade Board, Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries, AIC, JMEA, JBDC, just to name a few, and also international agencies, such as Caribbean Export, the International Trade Center, and Chambers of Commerce, 
so that we can be better positioned to help you build your brand awareness and export revenue. As prospective exporters or buyers, and I know both of you are online with us today, your first point of contact is usually with our so local sector managers who can guide you on the market opportunities in their respective sectors. Overseas buyers tend to contact our regional offices to gain supplier intelligence, that's intelligence on who are the local suppliers of their products that they're interested in and find out what products Jamaica can supply. Our regional offices are located in Kingston, focused on new markets such as Latin America, Dominican Republic, China, uh, Mexico, and other new markets. We have offices in New York and Toronto, London, and of course in Western Jamaica in the Republic of Montego Bay. So we have offices in the key places that you want to, um, to reach. Our regional offices function as much more than client services hubs. They actually provide market intelligence on the latest customer trends. They meet buyers to gain a deeper understanding of distribution channels and packaging and labeling requirements. They advise on market access through trade agreements. They troubleshoot issues with products sent into the marketplace. Our London office, for example, advised our Ministry of Agriculture some years ago on the mango fruit fly issue and identified an investor to set up a hot water treatment plant in Jamaica, which will actually change the picture and allow us to get back into the UK market for mangoes. So that's just an example. Just last week, our London office actually held a meet the buyer event, attracting over 30 buyers of the likes of Selfridges and Harrods to come and look at an array of Jamaican products exhibited in the High Commission in London. So these are the kinds of things that Jampro can do. And through the dedicated efforts of our regional offices, we have been able to deep linkages in traditional markets such as the US, UK and Canada, while providing in-market support for our clients. Together, they help us connect with the diaspora while boosting brand Jamaica. In conjunction with the regional offices, our agribusiness and manufacturing teams, which are located in head office in Kingston, actively seek buyer and export opportunities for local producers and manufacturers through value added services, including business matchmaking, market intelligence, sharing, customized market information and market penetration support we accompany you to trade shows and trade events internationally. And many of the participants in this morning's gathering have benefited from those services. To better assist you in meeting your growth and export needs, Jampro has developed several key initiatives, including the extremely successful Enterprise for Export Growth and Development Program, popularly known as Export Max an online self-paced course providing a step-by-step -step guide to exporting, which is being delivered through the UWI Open University and the recently launched economic diplomacy program to broaden our outreach to new markets. I'm gonna say a little bit more about Export Max because I think it's such an important initiative and I know a lot of people are constantly curious and interested in the progress of this program. Export Max is an enterprise development program which prepares and facilitates companies to export more, but to do so sustainably. The program was first launched in 2011 and has demonstrated continued and resounding success. The program in its partnership with its stakeholders and sponsors, both private and public, has provided economic relief to SMEs and removed trade barriers that benefited the wider export community through advocacy interventions. To measure the efficacy of this program, Jampro has outlined key performance indicators for the Export Max program, including 50% average growth in export sales over three years, the preparation of market penetration plans for all clients, 100% of exporting companies accessing one new market. We have actually met and continued to surpass these targets. So we're actually delivering on the promise we made at the start of these programs. On the Export Max 1, Jampro facilitated the penetration of 33 new markets by participants, including non-traditional export markets such as New Zealand, 
Australia, and others. If we look at the numbers, over 33% of all the export max participants in that cohort reported growth in export sales, accounting for an average growth of 31% over the two years of the pilot program. On a nominal basis, this represented growth from 1 billion J dollars to 1.396 billion. The second staging was even more successful with a 213% average growth in export sales for 19 of the participants. One of the participants was a first time exporter and was able to export a full container load of product to a Caribbean market on its first attempt to enter that market. This is really a noteworthy accomplishment and we were very excited to see that happen. The number of jobs provided by participants during the second version of the program increased from 1,356 to 1,529, a 12.7% increase. In our current iteration of Export Max 3, has actually delivered an impressive 30% growth in export sales across 14 participating companies as at the end of December 2021. This achievement, you know, is really in the context of COVID, a noteworthy achievement. Against the backdrop of these successful stagings, Jampro will be executing a fourth iteration of Export Max, which will start sometime later this year or early next year. I just want to also mention before I close the step-by-step -step guide to exporting, which is an online self-paced certificate program in collaboration with the UWI Mona Open Campus, which is targeted at newly registered exporters, aspiring exporters, customs brokers, and other logistics service providers. And the whole point of this is really to break down into very manageable, understandable language the the step-by-step -step route to exporting which we call ready set go so ready covers preparing for export markets looking at financing options set covers certification and licensing requirements and go covers getting your products shipped and exported so that's really one of the ways that we can really make exporting live for those of you who are just starting out so in closing, let me reiterate that Jampro is your partner in exporting from delivering market intelligence to advising on market access and trade agreements to introducing you to the right buyers. We have an exciting morning lined up looking at export from the demand side and from the supply side, which I'm sure you will find enlightening. And just before I wish you a really productive morning, I just have to apologize to, to uh, Minister Dunn because I think I called him Senator when he actually is an MP. So Minister, sorry about that. Um, I think this was the excitement of being before the camera. But all of you, I really wish you a productive morning. I know this is gonna be a really interesting and rich discussion and extremely productive and give you real tips from practitioners and practical people on how to get into the export market and ensure that Jamaica continues to deliver world-class products to the global market. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diane, for that wonderful presentation. Certainly you have demonstrated that Jampro has been, Jampro is, and will continue to be partners to the exporters here in Jamaica and facilitators to buyers worldwide. Thank you very much for that uh, official welcome and for those remarks. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, allow me to introduce to us this morning, Senator the Honorable Aubin Hill, Minister of Industry, Investment and Commerce. Uh, Minister Aubin Hill has over 35 years of working experience in the private sector as an international banker. He has lived in nine countries and done business in more than 115. With a Harvard MBA, Senator Hill spent 21 years as a banker in the Middle East, starting in 2002. He also led the management team which completed the successful turnaround of one of Jamaica's largest banks and in the Caribbean as well, the National Commercial Bank Limited. And between December 2005 and October 2011, Aubin led the team which successfully divested the loss-making government-owned sugar assets, which consisted of five sugar factories and six estates. In March, 2016, Prime Minister Andrew Holness appointed Aubin to the Senate 
and he subsequently elected he was subsequently elected as deputy president of the senate the prime minister also appointed senator hill a non-resident high commissioner for jamaica to india in october 2017 Aubin was chosen as the ceo of the prime minister's economic growth council after the prime minister andrew holdness was returned as the prime minister in the landslide election on september 3rd 2020 he invited senator hill to join the cabinet in the ministry with the, which the prime minister leads the ministry of economic growth and job creation minister hill has re responsibility for water land bpo the special economic zone authority of jamaica and special projects as decided by the prime minister and finally in my introduction of the minister on january 11 2022 prime minister holness reshuffled the cabinet and appointed Minister Hill as Minister of Industry, Investment and Commerce. Minister Hill has portfolio responsibility for 22 agencies and departments, including JAMPRO, JANAC, the, cabinet, the Cannabis Licensing Authority, Trade Board Limited, Companies Office of Jamaica, Consumer Affairs Commission, and the Bureau of Standards. Ladies and gentlemen, our Minister, Senator, the Honorable Auburn Hill. Good morning, Minister. Mr. Conrad Robinson, thank you so much for your introduction. And Diane, thank you for your, your opening remarks, comprehensively outlining what Jamper has done. Minister of State in my ministry, uh, Dr. Uh, Norman Dunn. Um, of course, Ms. Diane Edwards, who is the head of Jamper. Dr. Al Powell, CEO of, of Agro Investment Corporation. Mr. Stephen Dawkins, who is the chair of the JMEA Export and Logistics Standing Committee. Mr. Mohan Jagnarain, Executive Director of Spur Tree Spices Jamaica Limited. We know that company well. Media practitioners, ladies and gentlemen, it's really my pleasure to join this exporters forum being held by one of my ministry's leading agencies, JAMPRO that will provide much needed market insights and support to exporters. Um, exporters are extremely critical to my view as a new minister in this ministry. I'll say more about it in a bit, but I want to join Diane in, in, in saying manufacturing uh, is recovering. Um, they recorded about a 55.6% increase in domestic exports. Um, in the past year or so. Um, but I want to encourage, as I have, when I met with the traders, um, when we were talking about prices for food and other material, I want to talk about the fact that traders have been in Jamaica for a long time. I started my career in the retail store of Time Store um, after I left high school. So I know traders for a long time. Traders have made a lot of money in Jamaica, and I'm happy for that. I'm very, very happy. This ministry is the Ministry of Business, and I want businesses to be profitable. But I also want Jamaican businesses to begin to invest in manufacturing and preparing and providing services for export. We're down the road, but I need to see a lot more because unless we, unless we export a lot more, we cannot become a rich country. Why do I say that? We have 3 million people in Jamaica. We have sometimes probably more uh, in the diaspora than we have at home. We have 3 million people who have an average GDP of just over $5,000. If we sell only to those people with that relatively low um, GDP per capita, this country is never going to get rich. And again, why do I say that? Well, if you look at Singapore, who we all like to look at, they have 5.7 million people, but their GDP per capita is 60 to 65,000 US dollars, at least 12 times the size of ours. And Israel has a very, uh, maybe 8 million people, and they have a huge GDP per capita. Now, where do they get that GB, GDP per, per capita from? I can promise you Singapore, didn't make that 60 to 65 million GDP per capita by selling 5.7 million Singaporeans. 
they sell to the world. We need as Jamaicans and as Jamaican traders and business people, entrepreneurs, to invest a lot more in Jamaica to produce stuff. Um, what, I, what do I mean by that as well? I've been talking and we've agreed, Minister Colonel Charles and myself, that he has his very strong agricultural program. More and more of that is going to come out. On the investment side, as the minister responsible for investment, we wanted to look at joining with agricultural entrepreneurs, with business entrepreneurs, to take, for instance, if you look from St. Catherine to Westmoreland, you can't find a well-run um, uh, storage, cold storage area. We need to build them. I know Jumper is on that. Diana has told me that she's working with investors and that that's the kind of cooperation we need to have with agriculture to make agro-processing going, get going. Because when, we, when our mangoes come in June to, to July or May to July, you see them on the street all over the place when you drive across Jamaica. What we need to do is to make sure we have agro-processors who will process those mangoes because our tourists come in, in December uh, to March, thereabout. That's when we need to use a lot of juices and mango is the base of most juices that you have. So just one simple example that we know of, we need to bring investors from the Ministry of Investment, uh, Industry and Commerce to meet with agricultural entrepreneurs to make sure we build that export business because we need to get our export to a place where our economy becomes stronger because we're exporting so much. We, we need to look at, you know, as I, as I look at agriculture before I move on from that, in 2019, Euromonitor, which is uh, an international publication, and they were engaged by Jampro to, to do a study for Jamaica, and they estimated now, just in roots and tubers, and what we're talking about here is yam and potato and maybe cassava, um, ginger, those, just looking at those roots and tubers, um, Euromonitor estimated that Jamaica could export another 61.2 million US dollars. Now, there is a market that, um, Diane, we, on the investment side, um, procuring investments, uh, can join with agriculture to make sure, and we must do it in a purposeful, clear manner. We are going to have investors invest in agro-processing agro and make sure that we get them to invest so that they can produce, not just for the local market, but also to export. Um, the Jamaica Special Economic um, Zone um, Authority, which is also under this ministry, is in the business of setting up a logistics center. We have been at it for some time. We're now down the road. We're looking to investors to, to, to make sure we have the 1,000 acre, um, uh, it might be hectare, 1,000 uh, acre plot of land north, south and north of the Mandela Highway to be made into a Caymanus campus for logistics. We are, one of the good things that come out of the pandemic, if there, any good thing can come out of it, is the fact that people have come to recognize that the long supply chain that you have from China or India or anywhere else in Asia or the Middle East, wherever else it comes from, is a risky business because you can't have control when a pandemic, pandemic hits or war uh, in Europe starts or somewhere else, it starts from. And so they're looking to nearshoring. Nearshoring is uh, a big part of what Jamaica can benefit from because we're right next to the biggest market in the world and the most powerful country in the world, the United States and right beside it is Canada. So we need now, the Jaceza has been working at getting investors in, working with the government probably to secede some of those investments uh, so that we can get the place prepared so investors can come in to put up their logistics center for pharmaceuticals. The last time when we had the pandemic, it was too far to get the drugs 
put them in Jamaica, ship them out to where you need to ship them in Latin America and North America. You need to, we need to look at um, the issue of manufacturing, cosmetics, uh, hotel services, all these hotels we have in Jamaica and across the region, there is no single 10 acre plot that you can go to and walk for three days and scoot out your entire hotel of 1,000 or 2,000 rooms, except for staffing. Well, we want that to be in Jamaica. So Diane is on the board of uh, Jamaica Special Economic uh, Zone Authority um, and heads Jampro. We're looking for that kind of uh, collaboration that we need to have to make sure we get export going and all that uh, will be the products coming, you add value to them, export them out, you employ people in the meantime, the economy grows. Banks have quite a lot of cash. The government has not been borrowing from banks. We haven't gone to the market. Minister Clark has been very careful to keep our, our, our borrowing down. So the banks have cash. They need to put it somewhere to earn money. The most, the most painful thing, I remember I ran banks for a long time, almost 40 years. The most painful thing a bank has is deposits in its vault that it has not loaned out to make a, a profit or to make an interest on it. So when banks have money, it's the time to go and seek money from them. Jampro and another agency, the Jamaica Business Development Corporation in this ministry can help you if you're a small uh, um, entrepreneur to get your business plans together to make sure you get the money from the bank. Um, JB, JBDC and uh, Jampro and the Jamaica uh, Manufacturers um, and Exporters Association have been working together as Dan has outlined in Export Max. I won't say anything more about that because we're going to give Export Max great exposure at Penn, at the Penn Relays uh, coming up in the later, later part of this month, where we're going to take, is it five or 10 companies, Dan, I don't remember, but a number of companies, five. We're gonna take five companies up there um, and give them a real showcase for their products because they've proven that they can export. And you can see, as Dan said, they're looking for 30% year over year growth each year and they have been producing that. Um, now we expect that to continue. So we're looking to give them the exposure, but in Jamaica, uh, 60th anniversary, we're looking for 60 companies out of Export Max, if I remember, uh, Diane, to, ex to, to showcase during our 60th uh, uh, independence celebration. So Export Max is going well. Jumper is working well to make that work for us. The JMEA and the Stock Exchange recently launched a, a program to get more um, exporters and ordinary companies registered on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. I was there as your guest speaker. I like to see that. I bring out one example for you. A woman called Karima Munse started her, her um, the spices and, and sauces in her house, didn't have the, the expertise or frankly the money. She got it, she got uh, hooked up with an investment banker who helped her, show, showed her how to do her books and buy and sell and so on and export. Today, she is exporting 70% of her products and she's now looking to, to place her business on the stock exchange. So there's growth happening. There's a big export event that is coming up on which I'm gonna close. It's called, it's from the World Free Zone Organization. In 2019, the Jamaica Special Economic Zone Authority won the right to host the Re World Free Zone Organization annual conference in Jamaica. Well, they haven't had a face-to-face -face one for three years. So this one coming up in Jamaica is your big issue. It is Jamaica's biggest conference um, since before the pandemic. So both of us have a great interest in making it a success. We have people coming from, um, from 140 countries, probably up north of a, a thousand people will be here. We expect more. The Jamaica Special Econ Economic Zone Authority is working with the World Free Zone Organization. The head of the World Free Zone Organization is here right now. In fact, I leave this to go to a press conference with um, two other ministers 
to, to continue what we launched in Montego Bay yesterday to get Jamaican businesses to buy booths in at this conference because you're going to have all these international investors coming in. It's a time to showcase Jamaica. It's a time to showcase your company as a business in Jamaica. And it's an export event. Why? Because we are providing the service to, to host this conference in Jamaica. But foreigners are coming in to spend their money. We have ministers of industry coming in, academics coming in, business people coming in. And so while we're hosting it in Jamaica, it's an export event because all that money is coming in. So on the note of export, Dan, keep the, 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 the truck going, keep the, the enthusiasm going. Max 3 is doing very well. Let's get a lot of other exporters in there because we are never going to become a rich country unless we export a lot more than we have now. That's how Singapore and Israel and others get wealthy. This is our charge. It's a good conference. I wish you well, and I wish you every success. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Hill. I'm really very happy that you were able to join us this morning. I know that you have a very busy schedule. Um, so thank you again for joining us and for giving us the charge. Certainly, Diane and No have taken note. And as we indicated earlier, Jampro is leading this charge to help drive export, hence the reason why we are having this forum. Thank you very much, Minister, for your time. And I'm sure you will hear of the questions that will come uh, pertaining to your ministry and how it is that you continue to help to assist exporters in Jamaica. Thank you very much no, for Mr. joining us this morning. Mr. Chairman, I want to say something else because it affects Jampro. Jampro, I spoke to Diane a couple of days ago, and we agreed that um, I wanted to have an ex a set of export experts advising me in the ministry. So I asked Diane for two of her senior managers, which she has agreed to kindly, a second to us. We have four people from the ministry and one from the CLA, the acting CEO of the CLA, to work with me to, first of all, Diane, what we're going to do is mine the data we have. We're not going to ask the exporters for any more data. Apparently, we have a lot of data at, at your shop and in the ministry. Mind that, get the data, then we begin to set policy as advised by the data. That's all I'm going to say now. You're going to hear more about it. But thanks to Jampro. And we're serious about, about export, which is why I have this expert team in the ministry to work with me on making sure we make the right policies. Thank you very thank, much. Thank you very much, Minister. And I'm sure we will all make a success of it once we're working together as a country. Thank you very much again for joining us this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you again for, for participating this morning. I just want to remind you, if you have questions, we're going to ask you to put those questions in the Q&A box. It's important that you put it there so that we can respond during the course of the, the webinar. So a part of this webinar involves two conversations. The first conversation, is going to look at the demand side. What is it that the market is looking for? Uh, what are some of the successes, the challenges, and the solutions um, for the demand of Jamaican goods in the market, in our traditional markets, primarily UK, uh, Canada, and the USA? And to lead that discussion is Norman Nair, who is the Vice President of Sales and Promotion at Jampro. And so I invite Norman to come now, and he will introduce his panelists and he will continue the conversation. So over to you, Norman. Thank you, Conrad. Uh, let me just say all protocols observed. Uh, good morning again to, to our, our panelists, to our guests joining us, the team here at JAMPRO, uh, other distinguished guests. Um, as indicated, I'm Norman, our Vice President in Charge of Sales and Promotion. Our minister who just departed, I call uh, our minister of of industry and, and commerce, uh, investment and commerce. I call him our export evangelist and he has become an export evangelist. And, and one of the, the terms he constantly make reference to is as a country, we can't get wealthy by selling to 3 million people that lives here. We have to sell to other jurisdictions like the Caribbean and Latin America. We also need to seriously consider the diaspora markets as we estimate that there are over 3 million people living in the ja Jamaica diaspora. They are already familiar with our products and services, making it a much easier market 
in which to sell our products and services. And so it is fitting that on this, the first of two panel discussion on Jamaica export trade, we explore the opportunity in the Jamaica diaspora to better understand what are the demands of those markets? Where are we seeing some successes? What are the challenges and how we can mitigate them? Our panelists are seasoned distributors drawn from the Jamaica diaspora in the UK, US, and Canada. They'll help to shed some light on the issues highlighted. So allow me just to quickly introduce the panel. First up is Mr. Oswald Reed. He's a US distributor. Uh, Oswald Ozzy Reed is a West Indian brand manager at Iberia Foods Corporation, where he has worked for the past seven years after migrating to the United States in 2012. Prior to migrating to the United States, Mr. Reed was employed to the Jamaica Biscuit Company Limited, Excelsior, for over two decades. During the, his years at Excelsior, he held positions of export manager and domestic sales manager. Iberia Foods Corporation is the exclusive distributor for all Bermuda's brand in the USA, uh, from which Oswald Real hails. Our next person on the panel is Mr. Jeremiah A. Johnson, and the A stand for agribusiness. is a CEO of Agrimills, Caricom Import and Export International Inc., New York, and director of the Agriculture and Food Development of Urban Hope Gardens and Farms LLC in Florida. Since 2007, Mr. Johnson has had several exploits in agribusiness, notably in building bridges between the Jamaica and America uh, Farmers Network, also working with the farmers in Florida and mid Georgia, operating a successful produce and goat meat project on 312 acres of Orange Grove Farm. It was the events of the pandemic that highlighted the food demand and corresponding shortages that gave birth to the company, Agromills Caricom Import and Export International, which started to build multiple food bridges with farmers, food processors, and manufacturers in the US and the Caribbean with markets in Florida, Georgia, and the tri-state region. As I know, the company serve and have access to three major markets. They are one, the set of 71 supermarket network that has outlets in Florida and New York. Two, a food distribution network of over 200 outlets with stores in the tri-state region and Florida. Three, a major spice manufacturing operation that is interested in developing a 1,500 to 2,000 acres spice operation in Jamaica to plant ginger, hot peppers, and turmeric for processing. So therein lies a lot of opportunities. And then finally, uh, uh, Ms. Heather Chavans. Ms. Heather Chavans had a successful career in banking which spanned some 31 years, where she was a commercial banking director. She retired in 2015, and two, late, two years later, was drawn out of retirement to work at D's Import Limited in 2017 as a business development director, using the same skills she achieved during her banking career. D's is the largest importer, importer of Caribbean foods in the UK, which is owned by a director of Jamaica origin. The owner has social consciousness and ensures that D's give back to the community. For the past two years, Dees has been a proud sponsor of Food for the Poor Jamaica, funding the building of homes for those Jamaicans most in, those Jamaican most in need. Dees customer base is made up of grocery stores, supermarkets, cash and carries, and food services business throughout the UK and mainland Europe. Dees is constantly looking for new products to introduce to the UK market. So uh, just wanna say, um, you know, welcome to, to the panelists um, for joining us um, this morning. And I just wanna immediately jump into it and just ask, you know, um, 
how successful has your company been in distributing uh, Jamaica foods? Oh, I see one of our, our, our other panelists, uh, Depish Patel. Uh, Depish, I, I want to do you justice and also uh, introduce you as well before I jump in the discussion. Um, so Depish um, is uh, from Less Alignments, uh, which was established in 2009 as a wholesale distributor for Caribbean foods catering to the needs of independent retail businesses, as well as restaurants for products ranging from fresh to dry frozen foods. Very soon after, they were offered the distributed products for Grace Foods Canada and for the province of Quebec. They, however, continue to add to their product line many other brands and foods which originate from all over the Caribbean. Barbados, Jamaica, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Trinidad, as well as Dominica Republic and Haiti. They strive to be Quebec's one-stop business where their clients find everything they're looking for. So we have a, a, a all-star cast hailing from the diaspora, the UK, Canada, and indeed the USA. So as I indicated before, I just wanna quickly jump into a, a few questions and, and I invite the panelists um, to share their perspective. Uh, we're pretty keen on understanding your company. Um, how was the success uh, of distribution of, of Jamaica products? If you could talk a little bit about the success you have uh, enjoyed in the distribution of Jamaica product. And as always, we start with ladies, ladies before gentlemen. So Anna, share with us the perspective from, from UK. Okay, so we've been successful in a good cross-section of, of, of products from Jamaica. Um, we start with beverages, um, syrups, seasonings, um, banana chips, biscuits, crackers, and <coughs> callaloo. Now, the success from those products is largely due to the fact that they have a long shelf life. We have to have that. They, all the products that we take into the UK must travel well. Um, so when we're looking at new products, so I, I've been in Jamaica for the last four months and I'm looking for new products. And I thought, oh great, honey, let's do honey. But honey doesn't transfer well to the UK. It crystallizes as soon as we get it there. So we have to look at the, the bigger context when we're, we're looking for something that will successfully get into the, the UK market. Um, so one of the other issues that's really, really important um, is the packaging side of things. Packaging, labelling, as, as most people will probably be aware, you know, due to um, the, the local regulations, all allergens, etc., have to be noted down. So, you know, these are the things that we have to overcome when we're looking for products to come into us. Packaging has to be right to maintain the integrity of the product. Um, the labelling, the supermarkets will not take it if it doesn't have the right labelling. And we've actually had instances where we've had to take products out until the labelling is put right. So, you know, the, the, the other side of it is the food service business, which is absolutely great for D's. You know, during the pandemic, when, when nobody could go to a restaurant, but they could get the takeaways, um it, that that was really great as far as the seasonings and the beverages um you know the sales just skyrocketed so it's great that we're in both supermarkets the grocery and also in the food service business arena um because we're, you know we're tackling the consumer then from from both angles those who are actually cooking or using the products that you know the end users or those who are preparing um to to put their spin on it to go out to the end user Okay, thanks, um, thanks, um, Heather, for, for, for sharing. Um, clearly, we identify some some clear opportunities on which to, um, you know, where we are seeing strong demands and, and of course, the challenges. Um, I am just going to turn immediately to um, Mr. Jeremiah Johnson. Um, Jeremiah, you know, just coming out of the pandemic, uh, you saw this as an excellent opportunity and, and formed the business. What has been your success and, and the challenges that you're seeing here? Well, um, thank everybody for having us. I brought along here beautiful pumpkin from home and, um, and some cassava. So they came to the meeting with me. 
and uh, I have some mangoes, my mango tree over here. We came to the interview together. So um, uh, greetings from uh, New York, um, from Oneness. This is where our hub is on, um, in uh, St. Albans. And um, the, the pandemic um, opened some wonderful doors for us in Florida. Um, we moved from commercial from our farm that was up in uh, St. Cloud and we set up an urban garden in Palm Bay, where our home is. And um, we use that urban garden, not only to provide food, um, that is run by myself, my wife, and my daughter in Palm Bay, and members of our local church. We use that to uh, plant food in Palm Bay, urban hope gardens and farms, but we also planted hope. That was a wonderful success. It was good to see the impact, it, the impact of the pandemic, but the fact that fresh food, so what we did, which was revolutionary, was that we took up our front lawn um, on, on Port Malabar Road, and we covered the entire um, grass area, the whole yard with colorlu and colored greens and okra and all that. And so people could stop and buy food and have good conversation and get fresh produce in Palm Bay. That open challenge, uh, open uh, opportunity, and we was able to satellite that into into um, St. Albans, Queens. So we're on um, Linden Boulevard at One Nest, which is this assembly here. And they gave um, room to, for us to bring the urban garden to, um, <coughs> to Queens. And so Jamaica was able to transform from Jamaica to Palm Bay into Queens the urban garden sitting right there at um, 19801 um, Linden Boulevard, which is uh, One Nest Pentecostal Church. So we use this opportunity during the pandemic to shine light, taking the ministry from inside the assembly to the road. We're able to supply fresh color loot to all the people along the road, um, local people coming by, supplying a number of shops down the road on a local level. Um, the produce industry is alive and well. Um, Jamaica food is in great demand, all right? I want to emphasize that. What we have to understand now is that our food, our Jamaican food, is in high demand, but the food is in transition. For example, we're working with our, one of our team companies in Jamaica, um, Agro Mills Jamaica Limited, headed by Duncan, Donald Duncanson. Uh, we are in the process of um, uh, setting up shop. But for example, this year, pumpkin. Um, many times we see the pumpkin. This is a kabacha, which is a tin pumpkin, a tin skin, tin skin pumpkin. But the pumpkin is in transition. The pumpkin is moving from fresh produce into powder, into juice, into butters. And that was what you understand. Our cassava, similar. The cassava is, it, has, it is multiple, multiple. So we're looking at um, moving the cassava from a fresh produce into a frozen food, into a, into a cassava flour that goes, finds its way into baking because of its low gluten, no gluten content, you know? Yeah. And so therefore, what we find now over time is that um, our country and the history has moved from the industrial to the agrarian, back to industrial. And yeah. so we are into technology. So what we understand yeah. now is that we are not so much feeding the body in terms of a lot of physical activity. We are now feeding the mind in terms of nutrient. And yeah. so this is yeah. what you know, we have to understand in the sphere. So our, yeah. our, our team company, which I'm a part of, Agamil's Jamaica Limited, Donald Duncan is in the process now of putting together a team of us to be able to establish a facility to accommodate other farmers and to be able to grow, to bring the fresh produce out through other partners. And so just wanted to share with um, the entire world as it is now, be at Jampro. And I wanted to say special thanks to Jampro New York, uh, Mr. Shane um, Angus and Miss uh, Rochelle Lewis who have been you know, important in helping us um, along the way. Great team, good personality, and help us through some fights. And you know, uh, Shane and Rochelle, good referees. <laughs> yes, yes. So listen, uh, so, thanks, thanks, <laughs> thanks, yes, thanks, Zerma. Clearly uh, a lot of opportunities there, and, and you have seen success with you know, the, the fresh produce, um, highlighting some there in, in your background. I'm going to stay with the USA, and I'm going to invite, um, you know, Mr. Oswald Reed, just right to on. share from his perspective, what, what are some of the successes that you've seen? Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah. 
Iberia Food Services 12,000 accounts all across the U.S. Eastern Seaboard and Midwest. We distribute from seven distribution points directly and a sub-distributor in the Baltimore area. Now, it is important for us to ensure that the products are wherever our Caribbean consumers shop. So wherever you find that there's an opportunity for us to have our Jamaican products or our West Indian products in, let's say a Walmart, a Target, a CVS pharmacy, Walgreens, and we are there. We have that infrastructure. We have the distribution network to get the products into those accounts. And that's one of the successes that we have had in getting West Indian products into those accounts for our, our West Indian consumers to find that. Okay. Um, we have a sales force of over 350 persons, men and women, and they do direct store um, delivery. They go directly to the stores. And um, it, with that, we are able to manage the brands that we sell to ensure that, and I know Ed had mentioned the, the shelf life of the products. We have to make sure that whatever products that we are distributing, those products are fresh, if not, then we'll have to remove them from the trade because we represent the brands. We build brands, okay? Um, and we have to make sure that whatever representation we give to our brands is of the utmost um, quality or importance, okay? Okay, um, thanks, thanks um, to us all. And then of course, I, I won't um, finish without um, getting a perspective from the PESH. The PESH, um, can you share with us, you know, the, the, some of the successes that you have had uh, distributing Jamaica products, uh, if you will? Sure. Thank you, first of all, Mr. Nar, for introducing us. Uh, our first time being on uh, the panel, and uh, we are, I believe, a fairly newer company compared to the rest of the panelists over here. Um, our name is Liz Aliment ADP or ADP Foods in English. We in Quebec have to start with a French name. And so that's why our uh, original name is uh, Liz Aliment ADP. Uh, but we could be referred to as ADP Foods at any, any time because that is the direct English translation. So uh, we started in 2009 and uh, um, I have grown up in uh, uh, in a family that has been uh, dealing with uh, Caribbean grocery, and so I had grown up in the in the field. Uh, I'd say starting by the age of ten, uh, knowing what a yellow yam was, being of uh, South Asian descent, I knew what a yellow yam was. I knew what a, a Jamaican sweet potato was. How to compare? Uh, what the difference is between a Florida potato and a, a Jamaican potato, and the uh, the uh, appreciation that a uh, Jamaican client had for a Jamaican product. Um, when we started in uh, Montreal, our distribution business. Uh, before that, before we had started, the way of bringing in most of the products that were of West Indian origin, uh, including Jamaica, was to bring it in from Toronto, which is uh, <laughs> the biggest city, uh, largest uh, market in uh, all of Canada, located in Ontario, and most of the products that come into Canada are being imported into Toronto, Ontario, and the GTA uh, today, many other cities around, around Toronto as well. Um, we, there are many jobbers that, you, that would bring it, that would take their vans, bring products from Toronto back to Montreal on order for many of this, uh, the independent, uh, 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 independent stores, not really for restaurants. And how the restaurants were able to get the products, the beverages, the spices, um, other dry products would be to go to these retail stores and pick up in cases or whatever quantity that they wanted uh, to run their business. Uh, so what we did was uh, set up a uh, location where we started bringing in everything in from Toronto in volume and made it that one-stop shop 
for yeah. most of these uh, retail businesses yeah. and restaurants, uh, including the food service uh, businesses such as uh, caterers. And what uh, that did was facilitate the uh, entire process for almost all of uh, th that independent business that uh, exists in Montreal yeah. uh, <clears throat> and the surrounding region. Uh, in, uh, in, my, in the province of Quebec, most of our market is based in Montreal, as well as the surrounding, uh, surrounding region. And uh, uh, it gets a little sparse when we move uh, further away from the city. Yeah, so, clear, clearly you have been doing very well in, in, uh, in Quebec, I, I, I must say. Uh, but, but just in terms of, um, you know, some of the uh, Jamaica goods, um, products that you have seen done well in that market. Um, we, we have a lot of uh, Jamaicans on the call. We want to get a sense as to, you know, um, what are some of the clear winners, uh, if you will, uh, for your market there that you serve in, in Quebec. Definitely. So we do a good bit of Jamaican produce. Okay. Uh, we are direct importers um, of uh, produce. We bring it in by air. It's not uh, uh, the volume does not uh, allow us to uh, do sea shipments in uh, in Montreal. So uh, we bring in weekly shipments into into Montreal by uh, by air. Um, uh, that's something that, uh, depending on the season, we bring in the mangoes, we bring in the uh, the uh, kalalu and the rest of the stuff, the staples like yam and yams and potatoes. So they do a good bit. Like that is a, a necessity for uh, all our clients. I well, all our retail clients. And after that, we do a good bit of curry powder. Okay. So in terms of spices, okay. a curry powder is a big mo uh, is a big. Uh, mover for us. Uh, there's Jamaican and there's uh, the Trinidad brands. So they do uh, uh, pretty well. Um, after that, we have uh, biscuits and crackers that uh, make up a good volume in our market. And in beverages, something that uh, it, um, originates in Jamaica, but uh, <clears throat> now has to be outsourced are um, malts which come from okay. Europe and they make up a good fair bit of uh, volume for us. Yeah. So okay. those are things that are used by basically all of our clients. Okay, good. Um, thanks, thanks very much, uh, Dupesh. So across the board, we're, we're seeing some successes uh, in various market. Uh, Heather, just quickly coming back to you and, and in the meantime, let's ask um, our, 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 our viewers or participants, if you could just pose your questions in the Q&A um, uh, section of, of your, your Zoom screen, not in the chat, in the Q&A. Uh, but Heather, let's quickly coming back to you as we look to try and wrap up. Uh, you started off indicating some of the challenges um, that, that you have identified, certainly working in, in your market, um, where the, the need for, for shelf life products, um, long shelf life products is, is where you focus. And certainly, uh, the bits around packaging and, and so on, the standards um, to ensure the integrity of, of the product, so consumer interest. Um, you know, even as you outline that, what are some of the other challenges you see and, and what are you know, some of the recommendations you'll put on the table for you know, um, you know, persons who are interested in exporting uh, to your market? Okay, so, so some of the other challenges are, are typical global challenges. Um, I think uh, Senator Hill mentioned um, challenges, you know, the usual war, pestilence, you know, what, what we've just been through. But of course, then we've got the exchange rates as well and regulatory challenges. Um, so for instance, when we bring in um, certain beverages now, some of them, not all, they're subject to an additional levy because of the sugar content. So, you know, that, that's another challenge that the business has to absorb some of it. We can pass some on to the consumer, but we have to absorb a lot of that. Um, the other thing, um, short supply. So we have um, Aki, canned Aki, canned Kalamu. But if there's a storm in Jamaica, we don't have canned Aki and canned Kalamu because, you know, the, the, the whole production phase. So a lot of what Senator Hill was mentioning earlier about warehousing and, and, and really um, getting the, the production side, um, that's encouraging. 
because we have such demand for Aki. As soon as it's in, it's out. Um, we, we have a, a good supplier of Aki. And that's the, the, the other thing is that maintaining the quality. There is a, a lot of different um, Aki on the market in the UK, but everybody wants D's. And I, I'm, I'm not joking when I say that, especially people of Jamaican origin, they want the D's Aki because it comes as whole pegs as opposed to mush. So, you know, that, that, that's another thing that is really important to us is that consistent supply. But of course, our larger competitors, we have some very, very large competitors and they will copy, they will copy our products. Um, and these are products which are coming from Jamaica, which they will then, you know, wrap it up in their own wrapping and, and call it something similar. So like our jerk seasoning, some of the supermarkets have their own jerk seasoning, nothing like the ones that we bring over. And some of our, you know, larger competitors, as I said, who are also in the distribution side, they are also producing their own seasonings. So the branding is really, really important. And what we, we link up to all the time is the authenticity of our brands being from Jamaica. We say to a lot of the people who supply us, Put the Jamaican flag on the packaging, big and bold, show it, because people are actually looking out for that. And I, I know there was some work being done a while back, I don't know how far it went, on actually patenting that or, or, or making sure that no other person could use that Jamaican flag if it wasn't authentic. So, you know, that these are some of the challenges that we have, but, you know, Deez has been around for well over 30 years and, and still going strong, still growing. So we're doing something right. We've got a loyal customer base and we're, you know, we're really pleased about that. Okay, thanks, thanks very much. Uh, let me just quickly go to um, our Q&A. Um, I'm mindful of the time that we're, we're at here. Um, one, Mr. Merrick Plummer asked, can our distributors share some of the main requirements of farmers they purchase from? Um, I, I'll just throw that out. Can any of you uh, address that? So that is, can you share the main requirements of, of farmers um, from which you, you purchase, um, you know, just coming out of Jamaica? I want to touch Jeremiah, on that. You look like you want to take that. Go ahead. I want to take that. Um, the question was, share some of the main requirements from farmers or by... Yeah, the main requirements of farmers that, that you purchase from. So we're, we're exporting from Jamaica. Um, you know, you as distributors are really um, purchasing uh, from us, you know, buying from, from Jamaica. Uh, what are some of the requirements of, of the farmers from which you, you are purchasing? Well, um, uh, one thing that we take a look at is that we encourage farmers to uh, connect to agencies like RADA, um, who is able to provide them some guidelines. Like recently, we got um, some sales for a farm out of St. Um, St. Anne. They are 10 acres of yellow yam. Uh, we connect them to um, uh, um, AgriMills Jamaica Limited, through Mr. Duncanson, who sent an agent out, uh, take a look at the field, assess the field, ensure that what the farmer said they have, and that the farmer who is speaking that the farmer is in charge of that field. And so we set in line now between, so going through RADA, going through a reputable um, processing house. And then that is one of the things, work through an agency that gives guideline, um, a producer who is able to take it, process it to code. That's it. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Jeremiah. So listen, in the interest of time, I'm noting a number of questions um, that has been posed in the Q&A. Um, we, we won't necessarily get to answer it now on screen because we want to move on to the next segment, um, the second discussion, uh, second of our two-part discussion. And, and I, I, I just want to use the opportunity to just, just thank the, the panelists here, um, Mr. Jeremiah Johnson, thanks for, for sharing. Uh, Oswald Reed, your perspective as well, uh, Ms. Heather Chavans, and Mr. Dipesh Patel. Um, thank you, uh, thank you for all that you have shared. Um, you have gleaned some insights on your know, products that we see are doing well in, 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 in your respective markets. And, and of course, you know, some of the challenges that you face and, and recommendations to move around them. So thanks, thanks for your time. I'll, I'll hand back over to our moderator, Mr. Conrad Robinson. Good.
Thank you very much, Norman. And a big thank you to your panel as well, because I think they did an excellent job in helping us to better understand what each of their markets demand in terms of, you know, not just the goods, but in, in terms of, you know, the quality of the goods that needs to get into that market, the packaging, all of those things, which are very important um, for recognition and visibility in, in their markets. Uh, one of the questions that I had, and, and, and I don't know, I, we will take the time because this is important, is if each of them could just give us an indication um, you know, of what their top three demanded products are in their market, um, then I feel that that would be helpful to the participants um, who are on this call for them to better prepare themselves to be able to meet those demands. So if you could just ask your panelists, this one last question for us, what are their top three demanded products in their market, in each of their markets? Well, you heard it. Um, Oswald, kick off. Okay, thank you. You know the usual already, the Aki jerk seasoning. You have corned beef, but there's a huge demand for coconut water and coconut products derivatives. Um, let's say coconut oil. You also have a huge demand for aloe vera drinks in the US market. So those are some opportunities. And I know Jamaica can produce those products. So those are products like you can look at. I just yeah, want to quick, yeah, I just want to quickly mention, you know, some of the challenges that, that we have. Um, two main ones, make sure your brands are registered in the US, okay? Make sure your factory is FDA certified. And the reason for that is because we started representing a brand. The brand was doing well, only to find out, it was a product actually, that the, the product was, or the brand was registered by someone in Florida. So we could no longer distribute that product. We were, okay. also, we, we were also representing a product that the plant wasn't FDA certified, so we had to stop representing that product. So make sure those things are in place when you're considering exporting, okay? Thanks, thanks, thanks as well. Um, really appreciate that, that bit. Um, and, and then just, just going to the others, um, uh, Depesh, can, can you share um, the, the three products from your market, top three that are in demand from, from Jamaica? Depesh, are you, you you're still online? All right, we'll just quickly move over to, um, to Mr. Jeremiah Johnson, if you could just share with us. Right, as I said before, um, the good the pumpkin from Jamaica, it is in great demand. Um, the pumpkin. Pumpkin. Hello. All right, that jerk seasoning. Right. And this is jerk. our brand that we're pushing, uh, a traffic. And this cassava is coming in. But what happened now, the cassava is changing form. It's coming right. in as the bunny. So what happened now is that this cassava has changed gear. And we don't want to miss the bus. So we have to understand that the cassava, um, we're taking the cassava now from fresh into a flower, into a finished product. Finish so it's product. one, two, three. And this is a product that is in high demand in certain markets. So those are one, two, three, not to mention the color low. And uh, we're going to try to address some of that um, need for Ms. Heather and Mr. Patel in respect to, and um, great, um, uh, um, to be able to get into some products to them. So uh, Mr. Aswell doing a wonderful job, you know, my brother on the other side of town, right? So um, that's my take on that, sir. Thank you, Jeremiah, you're doing um, a great job as well. Thanks, thanks. Um, Dipesh, if we could yes. just give you an opportunity. Yes, sorry, I don't know how I got muted before. So Ms. Chavans mentioned something very, very important and something I wanted to state as well. Authentic Jamaican product. So things that labels that have product of Jamaica mentioned in large do very well and clients are looking for that they want the original Jamaican product so today things like coconut waters coconut milks coconut oils creams they're all being outsourced from uh, uh, Sri Lanka Thailand if some of these items can come back from the islands from Jamaica uh, I think even at a premium price it's possible that they uh, they do uh, well. I believe there is a good demand for that that kind of a product. 
Uh, something else is uh, the uh, natural plant products. So uh, things like mavi bark, um, uh, sarsi, um, uh, these natural products, they're, uh, they're doing well. And I believe there is a market that is growing for them, the sea moss. So th that, that, that whole uh, range would uh, be something that uh, is interesting. Uh, clearly, everything coconut is is excellent for that market, along with the others that you share. Uh, thanks, the patient. And finally, um, Heather, uh, from your your perspective, top three. Okay, you probably picked up from what I've said previously, Aki. But I'm going to add for one, Aki and Kalalu because they come in together. Um, <laughs> the top ones, um, the beverages. So these are the juices which we have, and also um, we do sodas from, from Jamaica as well. And those go very well. And I'd say the, the last one, but certainly not the least, is the seasonings, all types of seasoning from Jamaica. Uh, I'm always amazed, especially for the food service businesses, because you know I'm, I'm not a great cook myself, I think, but surely they've all got the same flavor, but what they will do is use the seasoning as their base and then they can adapt it as they choose. And there's one particular brand, I, I'd rather not mention brands because I don't think it's fair to all, everybody, but there's one particular brand, we can't get it in quickly enough. Okay. Sometimes we have orders before the ship has actually docked. So, you know, that it, there is a big demand for that. Okay, good, okay. thanks again. So, so there you have it, um, you're getting a value for the money where the strongest demands are. It's obvious if we're gonna increase export, just meet the demands and, and you know it's laid out clearly um, for us on a, on a platter as outlined by our panelists. Back over to you, Conrad. Thank you very much, Norman. And again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for sharing the insights with us. We are very appreciative of it. And in fact, coming up now, we will be having a poll uh, that we, we are gonna ask our participants to, to respond to real quick while Gabriel get his team ready for the, for the second and final panel discussion in this morning's webinar. So while the poll is up, let me quickly introduce the second conversation that we'll be having this morning. So we have just finished looking at the demand side and the second conversation will be taking us into the supply side, delivering world-class export products, the success, the challenges and the solutions. And for that panel discussion, it is going to be led by Gabriel Heron who is the VP of marketing, and he will be introducing his expert panel, which comes from JMEA, Spur Tree Spices, Agro Invest. Um, so over to you, Gabriel, um, for this second conversation. Thank you very much, Conrad. And of course, I have to say, um, you know, congrats again on this amazing initiative. Um, welcome all to, to JAMPRO's fourth annual exporters forum. I think this is now a standard event in the calendar for exporters. And year on year, we we'll invite you to continue to being a part of this critical conversation. Now, as Conrad mentioned, we want to now focus on the supply side. We've had challenges, we have challenges, there's significant demand. Now I want us to now really delve into what are some of the market insights that can be shared from our panelists here today. Um, as, as Conrad mentioned, we have some expert panelists here that have a, a years and, and deep um, knowledge that can be shared first, Mr. Stephen Hawkins, and I'll be very quick because we don't have that much time. This is Stephen Hawkins, who has who is really wearing two hats today. He is the chair of the Export and Logistics Committee at JMEA, right? He's also the manager for exports at Wisinko Group Limited. He's had previous experience with Jamaica Beverages and Jerry and Nevis. So Stephen comes with a world of experience in um in Conrad. I'm, I realize that you want to go back to your poll. You're on mute. Yes, we, we would. In fact, I was just about to say we perhaps could take it at the end of your session. Um, but if you will allow, we will just put it up for um, a few more minutes. Okay, sure. No problem. So, so um, Stephen has a world of experience in the manufacturing and export space. 
So we also have Dr. Alexander Powell. He's currently CEO of Agra Investment Corporation. Um, he has had previous experience as CEO of, of Rural Agriculture Development Authority, RADA. Um, he is also was a group VP of thermoplastics and the GM for industry sales um, and separate limited. So he comes with over 25 years of experience in senior management leadership positions. And finally, and of course, last but not least, Mr. Mohan Jagnarin. Um, he's the executive director of Spur Tree Spices. He came to Jamaica as far back as 1983 from Guyana with a company called Caribbean Gum Limited. And of course, subsequently held senior positions with, uh, and a lot of us will know, remember Chicken Supreme, and then thereafter Island Grill. Um, we can see that Mr. Moham, Mr. Um, Mohan is officially a son of the soil of Jamaica. And I would like to say also, congrats to a spur tree on going public with a very successful IPO recently. And I think this is representative of, the, of where we are now as it relates to agriculture. So, I'm going to move into the questions very quickly, um, but before I just want to frame where we are now in terms of the supply side. We have a strong logistics base in Jamaica in terms of our geographic location and our proximity to the U.S., the Eastern Seaboard. Right, we have a diaspora of over three million, a strong Jamaican culture that influences the global cuisine, and of course we have the global customers who are engaged in Jamaican culture and cuisine. So there is a strong demand for Jamaican products. Goes without saying, both fresh produce and agri-process. Um, Jeremiah Johnson confirmed it. All the panelists on the, on the um, demand side confirmed this as well. So let's delve into the first question. In January, um, in the January to November reporting period, Jamaica earned export revenues of over 1.3 billion from products like coffee, fresh produce, and other agricultural products, beverages, sauces, and chemicals. Mining, bauxite took up quite a bit of this. But what I'd like to ask the panelists, um, what area within the export ecosystem should be given priority to enable significant expansion in export revenues? And where do you see the main opportunities for export? I'd like to start first with Mr. Stephen Hawkins, Stephen Dawkins, sorry. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, indeed, a fantastic discussion. Um, let me start by saying that while at the, when I was deputy chair at the deputy president at the JEA, we had done a, a target in which we want Jamaican exports to be, which was 2.5 billion dollars in exports. Now, at that time, we recognized that there was a lot of blockages in getting products leaving Jamaica and leaving our ports and so on and so forth. So we focus a lot heavily on fixing customs, getting things processed properly and so on. So we, 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 we focus primarily on removing blockages. But as time goes on, I know the merger between the JME and J and the JEA, the JME and the JEA become the JMEA, yes. which I know leads that logistics and exports department. One of the problems that we find is really capacity. And I use the word capacity in that our exporters, um, generally speaking, do not have the capacity to. Look, we heard Minister Hill earlier on saying that we are focused on 3 million people when there is 40 million people that we can focus on in the region. And in order to get that done, capacity is where I believe that we should focus on with our manufacturing, manufacturers and agro-processors. And I say this to say that um, I mentor a couple of companies, a couple of companies in, in export. And in order to gain capacity, we also have to be investment ready. And I'm sure Mohan will speak to that, investment ready. In other words, Jamaican companies, I think we have a thing. This is, a, this is just a personal opinion. I think we have a thing where we do not want to give up any part of our companies to larger investment. In other words, 
the rather owning a hundred percent of a small rather than giving up 20, 30, even 50 percent right. in order to gain greater, yeah. greater capacity. And this is my this is really my focus right now. And this is one of the things that even um I think all Senator Auburn Hill understands what is required. And every time he speaks, I think, and I don't want to be pro Auburn Hill, but every time he speaks, since he has been minister in that department, I think he fundamentally understands what is needed to get expo export growing. And that critically is investment, investment in our companies who wants to export. I mean, you, we have the larger companies that I work for with Singo and we're growing rapidly pretty well over the years, but even our size, we sometimes find it difficult for a number of reasons to fill the demand, to fill the demand in, 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 in export. And as big as we are, can we effectively produce for all of the, the capacity in the United States? Can we effectively produce for the UK? Maybe not. We just simply don't have the, the capacity here as, as manufacturers and producers. But the investment that we, we, we spoke about, that is what will lead us to getting that capacity to growing. We, I, 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 I don't want to go on too long, but we are, the JME, you know, next month is exporters month. And we eventually coin a theme that is building back stronger through exports, right? Because we fundamentally believe during the pandemic, we recognize that we miss many opportunities with logistics issues in and around the world, capacity, other um, countries couldn't export to certain areas. And we miss a lot of opportunities. Some of us gain because our exports grow. I'm in beverages and it has grown phenomenally, especially in the UK, in the USA, it has grown leaps and bounds. But fundamentally, what I believe is that companies need to get investment ready. And a part of it too, and through my mentorship, and to get investment ready, you also have to strategize where your company is concerned in terms of having the right financials in ready. Many Jamaican companies don't have their financials, you know, on, uh, 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 ready on a ball for whatever reasons, and that is how you 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 can get um, investment ready. So I, I fundamentally like everything that. Doctor, I mean Senator Hill is 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 speaking about and building export, more investment in manufacturing, investment in agro-processing, the, the the logistics center, and so on. So that is who I would answer your question. Yes. Thank you, thank you for that, Stephen. And to reiterate, the focus is really on ramping up capacity because um, the right. demand is there. So we need to double down on capacity. Dr. Powell, thoughts on your side? Well, firstly, good morning to everyone here present. I just want to add um, to what um, Stephen was saying, because he did um, talk about um, some of the constraints we have here. We see the constraints as land and financing for people who are in agriculture. I mean, you go to the bank, I don't know if because people think agriculture is risky, but they don't want to give loans easily to people who are in agriculture. But notwithstanding all of that, um, to the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries, when we are the um, investment arm, we're able to develop what we call agro-parks and production zones, and we have done um have in place some eight agro parks and nine production zones we encourage people to plant grow things for export so we have identified some other that are needed abroad some were spoken about this morning and um so we continue to look at them 
um, what is needed in Europe, what is needed in North America, the Caribbean. And we have come up with things like ackee, breadfruit, ginger, sweet potatoes, scotch bonnet, pepper, dashing, soil, cassava, mentioned heavily here, pumpkin, pineapple, and last but not least, yellow yam. So what we're doing now, we have found out that a lot of the persons at the level of that agricultural development, they don't have the leadership to push export. And that is one another constraint because they are just there over the years. So we are now um, having some capacity building with them, training in export, and we'll soon be recruiting somebody to guide all that farmers can get. Can you get a tractor duty-free? Can you get this implement duty-free to boost your agricultural output? A lot of the farmers don't know what are the requirements. So we're just going to add a staff member to all of this. Um, we have also talked about um, FAO helping us with ginger and turmeric, which will form part of um, the export plan. But um, I tell you, we are having, um, it's our intention to have, a, not our intention, we're having a agribusiness investment forum next Thursday, April 21st at um, on Cliff Hughes Live and um, also on Zoom. And the intention there is to pull all the financiers for agriculture, exporters, input suppliers, and in one space, discuss how we can advance agriculture production and by extension, agricultural um, export. So that's where we are. And we're just taking the time out. This is not an ad, but we encourage everyone to register by visiting our website, www.agroinvest.gov.jm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Powell and and, and, just, and I will give it another plug, you know, Agribusiness Investment Forum, April 21st. Let's not forget. Yes. All Thank right. Thank you. So 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 we, we have so far um, uh, uh, attendees. We have capacity, very critical, and we have fin financing. Now, what I would want to, I want to move on to Jag Mr. Jagnery now to find out from him what are the key areas to enable significant expansion in export for me his perspective. Mohan, your thoughts? You're on mute. Yeah, good morning, good morning, Dr. Powell. Morning. Um, Stephen, good to see you. Uh, everyone, good morning, good morning. Um, thanks for inviting me um, on this discussion. You know, my passion and my dream has always been to see Jamaican export. Good to hear that Senator Arbin Hill spoke so much about it because, I, as he rightly said, it's the only way out of poverty. I mean, yeah. you know, for you to become rich because they, they, your our markets are too small in the Caribbean and, and, um, and hence Jamaica. We are, we are closest to the world's largest market. I mean, you know, very close next door. Um, some of the things that I think that we need to do, well, I, I would speak from the agro-industry side, because I think we need to, we need to see agriculture. Let's, let's look at, at export agriculture and, and sauces and, and, mice and yams and what, what have you. I think we have, to, we have to see agriculture as a business, not, not the traditional agriculture, because you can't compete. You have to be able to... Take, for instance, my pepper sauce, for example. I keep telling the farmers, look, as a processor, I cannot, I would not be able to pay you the demand and supply prices. That today it is sold for $80 a pound. When it becomes short, it becomes $180 a pound for, for the same pepper sauce because I can't increase that price to the, to the consumer and I can't up and down it. So what I, what I, what I say to them, is look, produce your best scotch bonnet, produce your best pepper, try to get your best soul at a premium price, your fresh soul at a premium price, and then your seconds, I can process, or your third, I can process, but you have to keep looking for that market. Or also, I heard from a, a farmer who was a very intelligent guy that just the other day, 
And he said to me, he, we, we came and visit the factory and we talked. And he said, you know what, what you said here makes sense. So if I plant 20, if I plant 10 acres of pepper, I will plant five acres for the fresh market and I will try and plant five acres to supply you so that when I have a premium price, I can be able to sustain my cash flow with the, with the fresh. And then I can be able to sell to you because that would help me to, to, to grow all the time because I will buy all I can from you all year round. Yeah. So yeah. I think we have to get agriculture as a business. It has to be as a business and we have to see it that it's not because you're exporting, you can just demand premium prices. If the consumer is gonna, is gonna determine the final cost of what you sell at. You know, so you are competing with other, other countries all over the world. You have to be able to produce, I heard the thing about coconuts. Um, you know, why don't we, we have to start converting some of those lands into coconut farms because it's coming from Sri Lanka. It takes years of investment. It's not an overnight thing. It, it will take years, but it, you have to start somewhere to be able to do it. And, you know, those are some of the things that I think that we have to, some of the things that, you know, we can't say that we want to export Scotch bonnet and we are not, pre, we are not at a premium supplier or premium quality of Scotch bonnet. Or if, if there's a, if, you know, if there's, uh, you know, we don't have a, 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 seed, a seed bank, for example, we have to have a, a good seed bank for Scotch bonnet. That whereby it, it's not this, you're taking from the same farm um, after two crops and then there is some sort of disease in the seeds, you transfer it, the, 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 the production cycle becomes less and hence the farmer goes out of, of, of business. So I think we have to invest heavily into that technology and to get yes. into that, into, the, into agriculture to become sustainable as a business. Okay. So, so, so I'm hearing and I'm glad for this range of feedback. Are you hearing me? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. The, the, so, so we have expansion in capacity. We have focus on financing. And from your perspective, you're saying that we need to recognize that agriculture is a business and focus on premium supply and pricing as a, as a, as a part of that generation of fresh produce. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm like what I'm hearing is showing a very varied picture of the things that we need to do on the supply side. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift over. Um, in fact, let me stay with you, Mr. Um, Jagnarine and Mohan. Jamaica produces world-class products, right? Distributed across the globe as exports. And, and, and clearly there's a high demand for it. And, and the su success of Spiritry is a testament to this. What has been the route to export success for spur tree spices? And um, what were some of the key tactics that were used to achieve this success? And I, and, I, and I want to share this knowledge base so that the up and coming manufacturers, agri-processors can get an idea of you know, where they really need to go to expand and so that Jamaica as a country and exporters can rise with the tide together because we have extensive demand that can be supplied. First of all, I think you have to start, you have to start with a product. So you have to decide, I mean, in in tree case, I was fortunate to have worked in the, in the food business in New York. So I was able to identify a, a, need, a need in the food service market. So I developed yeah. products to, to, to to, you know, to supply the food service market in terms of restaurants, um, whereby, because Caribbean restaurants, I think the failure was inconsistency. So I developed jerk seasoning, oxtail seasoning, curry seasoning, everything that you just add meat. So you, you put two ounces per pound and you get a consistent product every single day for the success of that. So I think you have to start with a, a product, you have to identify and you have to see, look, I want to be the best producer of this product. You have, so you have to start with quality because Jamaica is known for quality products. Okay. So quality is the main thing. You have to have a lot of passion. You have to decide, well, look, this is my product. I'm going to defend this. I'm going to love it. I'm going to make it work. And you have to prepare for the long slog. It is not just something that you says, I'm going to make this product and I want to export it. Because the, you, when you, you have to own your own product. In our case, we own the product. We, the distributor was just a route 
to get it to market. We owned it. We reinvested in it. We went there. We demoed it. We showed it to the, to the and we kept on doing it and doing it and doing it. I think some of the, some of the mistakes we make um, or some of the mistakes the, some, comp, some people make when they're trying to export, they just think that you can just make a product, send it to a distributor, and that's it. I think you have, when you make a product, you must be able to take it off and replace it on that shelf at least four times. Okay. Meaning that when you make a sauce, the consumer will try it one time. Okay, it's, it's okay, but your brand is not there yet. You have to be there to remind them, to remind them, to remind them. Consistent. And just doing it. And that is what I think. Quality labeling. Labeling is it's very important. You have to look for its world. You have to look. You have to spend money in, in your labeling, in your branding, in your in your in your um, thing. You have to look for us. You have to be able to look, you know, that you can compete with the other people on the shelf because you're looking at products on the shelf. And, I, and I'll tell you something, some things I do. You well, one thing I left on a you have to like traveling if you're gonna export. You have to mm -hmm. jump on a plane probably every month, every week, and you have to be there. The distributor would only assist you by getting it there because you have to establish your brand. So you have to jump on a plane, you have to go in the supermarket, you have to cook food, you have to demo it if you're doing food. But you have to get that product up. And I'll give you some of my experience. What I did, I go to supermarkets and I see the shelf pack up and, and my product and people are shopping. I buy my own product and move them off of the shelf that consumer sees that, that you know, somebody is buying this. The person behind me might try it. That's so you, right, you, right. Have, you have all what you call it, little gorilla marketing, and you have to have the passion that I want. I believe this thing can sell. I know I produce a quality product. I want the consumer to be able to try it. And then as you keep doing that consistently, and I remembered in one case, in one major supermarket, a major supermarket called ShopRite. The owner of that store was there and he saw me demoing. And he said to me, you, do you own this company? I said, yes, I own this company. I started it. He said, you know what, young man? I'm going to make sure you always get space in the supermarket. Because if you can stand there and demo your product and convince a consumer to buy it, I will help you to sell it. Wonderful. So I think, I think those are some of the things. You know, sometimes we can't just say because it's brand Jamaica, we're going to make it and it's going to sell. In some markets, yes. yes. But I think you have to be able to, and you have to reinvest back in your business. I mean, in, in, in our case, in Spurtry case, every cent we got, we buy new equipment. We buy new, because Spurtry started with a little blender, a little one gallon blender. Then... I keep on saying to myself, how do I make this thing more competitive? I cannot keep raising the price. For 15 years, we couldn't do a price increase. Couldn't not do it because 15. the US market, 15 years, they don't like to hear price increase. When they, we will talk about price increase in Jamaica where we can increase by four and five and six and 10%. In the US, you increase by 0.3%. Right. They so, don't like so, to hear so, price increase. I don't mean to, to, this is very, very insightful information, but in the interest of time, I know that we're, we're running behind, so I want to move on. But thank you very much for that information, Mohan. That was very, very we're, we're talking about quality products, passion, quality labeling, and of course, implementing mm -hmm. some guerrilla tactics, which are critical. I want to, you, you, we mentioned, and I keep hearing capacity investment. So I'm going to shift back over to Dr. Powell. Right, because there's a there, there's a key item now in terms of technology in agriculture, um, and and ag tech is being leveraged to enable improvements in scale, and consistency of produce, as well as of course to mitigate some of the inherent risk in the agriculture agro processing um, space. So, Dr. Powell, what are your recommendations for local farmers slash exporters? that want to utilize technology in agriculture to ramp up exports. Dr. Powell? Yes, thanks um, very much for getting me back here. Um, 
you know, the whole approach initially, the randomness in it. You just go and ask people to produce. Now, what we do here now is that um, we set quality standard. You must produce this type of cassava, for example, if it were 12 inches long. This yam for export must be like this. Sweet potatoes must have this color and so on. So we actually have quality controls on, on the parks and we're going to extend it further through using our Global Gap certification process. Because Global Gap is the international food standard that um, once we use it, it moves into a particular uh, accomplishment. And therefore, um, the Europeans very much like to know that we're having those standards. The pumpkin must be a particular size. Um, they, just about everything has standard now. So we're using the latest technology in terms of the standards, global gap standards. We are not using, we're using mechanical reapers and we have quality assortment before the things get to the market. So we're doing quite a bit. But we yeah. first with making sure that the C type is the C type we want to produce what we want. And one of the things I didn't mention um, earlier is that one of the products is the bandit. I'm sorry, I just mentioning it. It's the bandit, it's mango. And we're now putting in place a 900 acre farm with mangoes. Each investor put in 20 million in bar, um, in, in, into, the, into the, um, their production and so on. So we're very much with, um, with our technology in terms of our standards and the assortment that we use to push things into the export market. Thank you. Thank um, you very much for that, Dr. Powell. Um, Gabriel, if I may, Gabriel, I have a point. Sure. Um, in respect to capacity, um, I know we're looking at the Agro Park and it's a wonderful idea. Um, one of the things that one asset we don't want to skip over the, the original region of any one crop, whether it be um, products out of St. Mary or St. Catherine that normally be a zone that normally be a supplier prior to the agriculture going through whatever um, um, shakings. We want to go back into those zones where we have, uh, we have, a, we have a strong residue of, 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 of farmers who, are, who have that skill set. What we want to do is that as we develop the agro park, we want to develop this region. For example, um, Agro Mills Jamaica working with some farmers in Port Maria, St. Mary. Um, Delroy Bailey is a Kalalo farmer on Frontier. But in that region, we have we had Harvest Planters Cooperative that, that developed farmers who grow Kalalo and pepper and dashi. Now, those farmers within themselves um, is a capacity zone. So we want to encourage that rather was central in helping to train us at the time we were there in Frontier developing that. So we want to look at whether it be Islington or Igate or Rockabessa. We want to recognize and still keep developing those, um, call them free range farmers as a capacity within themselves. Um, Dr. Alpa, we'll thank you for your work and we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Jeremiah. I'm seeing a question here and, and, and Stephen, I'm going to come back to you shortly, but I just want to address this question here is, um, it, what is the potential of creating a cooperative with small farmers and business? Dr. Powell, I, I'd, I'd like to direct this question to you because we may have this um, operation at the moment. Yeah, um, this is something we do as a matter of course. Yes. Um, when farmers, the agropark farmers, and by extension, what we call um, farmers in other um, production zones, we try to get them into cooperatives because the cooperatives have several advantages. When we have a cooperative, the president, secretary, minister, we can take what the objective for the cooperative is and help to get right um, funding documents for them, 
For example, in some cooperatives, we have um, irrigation requests, uh, we have uh, seed requests. So we, by putting them into cooperatives, um, we can get several benefits for them because yes. funding agencies do not want to give individual benefits. They want to give benefits in a macro sense in cooperatives. So we do that as we go along. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. And, um, and that question, just to clarify, um, that question was coming from, from a, 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 um, let me just make sure I have here, uh, just Sharon C. Seymour, but I'll move on, I'll move on. So, so Stephen, back, back over to you um, as it relates to, to, to your vantage point. Right. You spoke previously on capacity and Conrad, I know that we're strapped for time now. We're just going to have this final input and then we move to a, 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 a bit more questions and then close. Um, but both from uh, in terms of the unsupplied demand for many Jamaican products overseas, we have an understanding that there's a need for to expand capacity. Right. Um, but but from your vantage point, what are your recommendations to overcome some of the logistics and other supply challenges? So outside of the a capacity expansion issue. Um, Gabriel, it is, it is, it is having been sitting where I've been sitting for quite a while, and yes. Mohan speaks about it, right? Where I sit for a pretty long time. I can't say much more than what I've said before where supply in particular, logistics and, 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 and managing your logistics, sometimes you don't have much control over it, right? Because it's all goods leave your ports to markets, to consumers and stuff like that. So you work as best as possible. But from a supply vantage point, what I realize is that, and having sat on the JME for so long, small, medium-sized companies, they tend to say, yes, they want to export. And I'm looking at the questions and many companies ask, what do I need to export? Now, if you keep thinking that you can produce a pallet of goods, yes, it's a great start. But a lot of companies, and I always say this, change the paradigm shift in how you think. When you're producing a new product or starting up, let us look at your product on a global standpoint rather than producing for Jamaica. Because the earlier panelists explained that sometimes our, 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 our products are not ready, are not ready, or are, are, are have the necessary labeling ingredients right for the major markets across the globe, which is in Europe and North America. And yeah. why I get back to capacity and investment is that you will start, but in order to export, there's so many dynamics that is involved. It's not like here in Jamaica where you produce something, you write your invoice, you have a delivery ship to get it to the supermarket. In exports, you have to have a multiple, ex probably about eight or up to 10 documents you need to have to get, a, get to a particular market. If you don't have that in-house support, it won't happen. How do you get that in-house support? Is getting your company equipped and ready. Right, how you get a company equipped and ready is to have a support investment program. I am happy the way um, Mohan spoke about his business starting, investing, reinvesting, and so on. No, there's so much capital in Jamaica that you have investors want to invest, want to invest. Recently, the JME signed a, 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 a MOU with the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Why we, why we signed that? Um, MOU is simply because we recognize that companies will need investment. It's not everybody going to go to the bank and get all, get all the funding. Bank interest rates are high. So sometimes they get equity and capital by other means. You have many venture capitalists out here that wants to invest in companies and grow. But what I said earlier is that a lot of companies just not ready, not equipped to do it. And that is my focus in which I would want to guide companies on. We can look at steps to export. We can do all of that. There are many, many organizations to support companies. But if you are not willing to make that 
stride, that investment, getting your company, as I call it, investment ready, you won't have the capacity to supply the demand that is needed out there. Thank you. Thank you for that, Stephen. And, um, and, and before I get into any more trouble for time, uh, Mr. Mr. Official Moderator, um, they, they, we have one, I'd just like to raise one more question and then we'll hand over. Um, the, the, this question is coming from uh, uh, Mr. Lewis. If export is part of your mission, you should develop, sorry, wrong question, one second here. Uh, how can farmers who are not planting in the agri park collaborate for export partnerships? Um, uh, Mr. Powell, Dr. Powell, my apologies. I'd like to, yes. to put this question to you. Well. I saw that question on your screen and I was smiling. Um, what we're doing here is to list all exporters of agricultural products so we can link um, our exporters with production zones, meaning where is that? area that produces yam, that area that produces cassava. Um, we are working with the GAS to have meetings so that we can address all the issues there. But in the interim, we have on our um, compound here about nine exporters that export to the US. So we can give some telephone numbers and you can call us and we can link you to them. And if the telephone numbers are um, 876 764 8071, 764 8365, and 561 6693. Call any of those, and we'll start the linkage with you because you fall outside the production zone and the um, agro parks. But thank, you, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Powell. And um, I'm, I will hand over to, to back over to our main moderator, Mr. Conrad Robinson. So, so folks, we have a focus on capacity, financing as in finding investment and recognizing that your operation, the agriculture operation, that business focus on your quality of the products, quality labeling and to yeah. reinvest back into your operations. As a country, we have significant demand. We produce quality world-class products. We, we, we are now hearing all the insights needed to move forward. Let us progress. Right. Conrad, back over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gabriel. And I just want to extend um, thanks again to your panel for sharing the information that they did with us this Absolutely. morning. Very practical, um, user-friendly information. And just judging by the discussion in the chat, it seems like a number of people really appreciated the insights that they have received uh, from this morning's discussion, conversations. So ladies and gentlemen, we really wanna thank you for joining us for this, uh, this webinar. And uh, we trust that the information that we shared with you this morning, you will find it useful. Just to let you know that the session is recorded and will be uploaded to our JamPro YouTube channel. So you can go over there and you can rewatch this, um, this webinar and you can share it as much as you like. Um, I know that there are questions about how we get in touch with the panelists and so on. We're going to ask you to send us an email through info at jampro.com and we will respond to that as well. Those people who have questions in the chat and you would not have heard them answer, uh, we will respond to you via email if those questions have not yet been answered. So all in all, it has been a great morning. We really want to thank everyone for participating. We thank our president, Diane Edwards. We want to thank uh, Minister Aubin Hill for sharing with us this morning. Norman and your panel of, of distributors out of the UK, Canada, and the USA. And of course, Gabriel, for your, your panel and for those people like um, from the JMEA, Stephen Dawkins, uh, Mohan from Spirit Spices, and of course, Dr. Al Powell from AgroInvest. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us, and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Take care.